first set was horrific. It was in Lafayette, yeah. went to a bar. We're all gonna do five minutes. Here's the light, that means you have one minute left. And I got to go up, and I had a yeast infection at the time. So I had a, a f***ed up genital situation, so I said, I'm gonna talk about that. I go up, I'm bombing, nobody cares, I, I sucked, I didn't know how to write a joke. And the guy is hitting me with the, with the light. But I, it was so far away that I thought he was like, like, you know when a, a rock band is killing and you hit the lighter? Yeah. I thought he was like waving like, hell yeah, you're cooking, baby. <laughs> and I just kept going. And then he cut the mic on me. Oh. And I remember being, you know, hearing a, hey, never, uh, never leave an empty stage. You know, the show must go on. So I kept going. And then eventually I looked to the side of the stage and he's going, get the f <laughs> off of there, you idiot. <laughs> Mark Normans, what hey. up, man? Good hey. to be here. I like the hey. I want to get like the uh, Michael Jordan, you know, the dunking uh, silhouette that they have for him for Air Jordan. I want to get that for me with yeah. this. Well, we run a branding agency, man. We can take care of that. Please, somebody yeah. make that. I'll, we'll I'll get, buy it. We'll get a photo of you afterward. We'll create a silhouette. Yes. We'll launch a shoe brand. Well, I don't know about a shoe brand, yeah. but uh, I'm not really the most uh, athletic. But, you know, give me a t-shirt. I'll, I'll wear it. Yeah. If you could start any brands outside of comedy, you like, what do you think you would start? I like, um, I like advertising because it's basically jokes. You know, it's like, uh, it's quick, it's succinct, get the message out and have it pop and catchy. Yeah, because I think comedy is about changing perspectives mm. or shifting emotions or catching people off guard. Sure. Kind of like... Similar to comedy, I guess. Yeah, when I was a kid, I, I, I still remember this. I saw a billboard, and it said, it was, it was Christmas time, and it said, uh, J&B Scotch. You can't have Christmas without J&B. Ingle L's, Ingle L's. You get it? <laughs> I mean, that's brilliant. When I saw it as a kid, it blew my mind, and that's basically, a, it's kind of a joke. It's like a bit. It's a bit, yeah. yeah. But that was a great ad, and I still... Remember it, and I saw that fucking, you know, 35 years ago or whatever. Yeah, uh, and I understand that you're from New Orleans. Yes, sir. Yeah, so how did you end up in New York? Well, I, I uh, grew up in New Orleans, drunk, idiot, loser kid with a bunch of jack-off friends vandalizing the city and just drinking, and I uh, failed out of three colleges. Uh, I was a waiter, I was a busboy, I moved furniture, I was a janitor. I just had all these kind of dead-end jobs, and then I tried an open mic, and I was like, this is something. I actually cared about it. You know, you try all these things and you don't really give a shit. You know, yeah. you're just doing it to do it. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll play the piano and then you give that up. And maybe I'll do karate and you give that up. So I just, <laughs> I did comedy and it's it stuck. And then you meet all the comedians and it's like this team and camaraderie and you're all weirdos together. Yeah. And these band of misfits, you come together and then... One guy goes, I'm moving to New York because there's this no comedy club in New Orleans. It's not really a comedy city. They don't embrace comedy. It's jazz, it's music, it's, it's uh, parades and Mardi Gras and culture and food and architecture, but there's not comedy. So I yeah. always want to live in New York. So we hightailed it to New York, moved to Brooklyn, got mugged three times in a year, uh, got bed bugs, <laughs> and did open mics every night, got a job as a janitor. And uh, then I just made it as a comedian. So how old, how old were you when you started the first mic? I think I was 22 when I did the first one, and it was so scary that I had to wait. I waited like six months till I did it again because really? I was like, I can't do it again. It was too it was too hard, too hard for me. Too much mind fuck. I, I couldn't do it. Really? Yeah. yeah. Were you like a funny guy, like in college? Totally yeah. a goofball class clown in college in high school. I won that. And uh, I was obsessed with comedy. I was obsessed with Norm Macdonald and George Carlin and Bill Murray and SNL and Eddie Murphy and all that shit. Loved it, living color and anything comedy I knew about. But I had such a low self-esteem and no self-worth that yeah. I was like, I can't do that. Yeah. It was like being an astronaut, you know? <laughs> it was a million miles away. So how did you write your first jokes before you got on to do your first set? Uh, I would... Well, I took a speech class okay. because I was like, this is something. It's some way to be in front of people talking. And I did a speech class and I killed in my speech. And uh, then I was like, all right. And I just used the speech class uh, tools they taught me. And I tried that with stand up and it didn't work because they're two different animals, but at least it got me going. Yeah. And uh, then I just did open mics for years, which is brutal. Yeah. Uh, and then moved to New York. 
Yeah, so you were like 26, 27 when you moved to New York? Oh, uh, no, I was probably like 23. Okay. I moved quick because there's zero, there was zero comedy. There's a little more now, but there was zero comedy yeah. in New Orleans. So you found you, your crew, they kind of embrace your weirdness, and you're like, yeah. this, is my, this is my crowd. Your crowd, you, you drive to, you drive three hours together to go to a gig, and it's all meaningless. It's, you do five minutes in Lafayette, which is three hours away from New Orleans. But you're in a car with these three idiots, and you're all drunk, and you're all saying horrible things, and you're laughing. And it's, it's, comedy is a great craft and all this, but it was also the lifestyle I liked. Yeah. You know, like, we're, people go, you're driving three hours for what? Oh, we're going to do a little open mic for five minutes. Oh, how much does that pay? Oh, it doesn't pay anything. You, you actually <laughs> have to pay sometimes to get on the open mic. And they're like, what are you, crazy? Why would you do that? You're like, I don't know. It's fun. I want to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, like, when you went on stage the first time, did, did you bomb? Like, did you do well? Like, what happened? Oh, first set was horrific. It was in Lafayette. Yeah. Went to a bar. Uh, we had a comedy meeting. All the comics met up. You go outside and they go, all right, you're, we're all going to do five minutes. Here's the light. That means you have one minute left. Uh, here's the order. Here's going to, you know, they put it on the wall. You're third, you're fifth, whatever. And I got to go up. And I had a yeast infection at the time. I had a, Shit. what they call jock itch. I was hooking up with a really loose lady at the time. <laughs> so I had a, a fucked up genital situation. So I said, I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> I go up, I'm bombing. Nobody cares. I, I sucked. I didn't know how to write a joke. And the guy is hitting me with the, with the light. But I, it was so far away that I thought he was like, like, you know when a, a rock band is killing and you hit the lighter? <laughs> yeah. I thought he was like waving, like, hell yeah, you're cooking, baby. <laughs> and I just kept going. And then he cut the mic on me. Oh. And I remember being, you know, hearing a, hey, never, uh, never leave an empty stage. You know, the show must go on. So I kept going. And then eventually I looked to the side of the stage and he's going, get the fuck off of there, you <laughs> idiot. And I was like, oh, geez. So I got off. But I, I bombed horribly, but I still liked it enough to keep going yeah what was it that you got from it do you think i think it was just a purpose like first it's a challenge of like let me see if i can figure this out let me see if i can make these people laugh because the per first time you play a video game yeah you walk two you feet should. yeah and then you, you do get a kill by a koopa troopa or whatever yeah and then you try again <laughs> and you get a little further and then eventually you beat it and i think that's what comedy was I was so like, let like let me see if i can go further you hit you got a little buzz from it you're like let me go again but you waited yes. six months yeah it was just so because it was so humiliating and it's yeah. so um kind of a little bit of a trauma where you're like jesus that was fucking but you're in the shower going oh what was that <laughs> what, what was i thinking people are watching you and then you you assume they're in their kitchen cooking going that guy was a fucking idiot huh <laughs> so it really sucked yeah. but uh you go ah what else am i doing let me try again yeah yeah and then how long did it take till you kind of like started to get good uh phew, man it took a while yeah it, it's so much failure because you got to think Let's say you do one open mic a night. You did five minutes. So trying to learn something in five minute increments takes years. <laughs> yeah. You know, like if you were gonna learn how to play the guitar and you only got, I gave you a guitar for five minutes and I took it away. Yeah. So that's the hard thing about comedy is you need an audience, you need a microphone, you need seats in a building and all these things. So uh, yeah, that, that, that makes it take so much longer. So I figured, all right, let me try to do like eight open mics a night. Oh, wow. And you could only do that in New York. Yeah. So you're on a train here, you're going to Bushwick, Queens, New York, Manhattan, uh, you're going up and down and you're trying to make them all. Then while you're on the train, you're fixing the joke and then you go up again and again. And uh, that was kind of how I did it. Yeah. And so you just went hard when you came to New York. You, go, you got to go hard or else it's pointless. Yeah. It's like Kobe Bryant. I'm not saying I'm Kobe Bryant, but like he would say, all right, how long do you practice? Four hours. All right, I'll do five. And then after a year, I have whatever an hour is every day for a year, I have 360 more hours of practice than you. Yeah, so you're like compressing time frames and trying to get more work in. Yes. So you can exercise your craft. And we chat to um, Mark Gagnon about this and he was saying that like being a comic is kind of like when you get on stage, you take another brick out of the wall mm. and reveal more of yourself oh, as uh, you go through it. And it was an interesting perspective because he was explaining it like you're discovering yourself. Yeah, and I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feed into that. No. Well, how do you, how do you see, process. That's cool, that's man. That's just how, not mine. How do you see the process? Like, how, do you, how does it... Um... I think it's about being funny. I don't think, like, I think if you can shed some skin or find out who you are, that's all great. But to me, that's secondary to being funny. Okay. So if you can find that while being funny, great. And that's probably better. Yeah. But uh, I think the funny comes first.
So when you say funny, like, like, how would you define that? Like, how do you define someone being funny or not? <laughs> well, I mean, that's a tough question. That's like, how do you define someone being attractive? Like, yeah. Well, that's the cool thing about funny is it's this weird, magical, little gay pixie dust that's on something. <laughs> like, some words are just funnier than other, and yeah. you can't really compute why. It's just the way... Like a fart is funny. Yeah. There's noise coming out of your ass. That's funny. <laughs> but like, yeah. why is that funny? I, I don't know. And uh, it just is. Yeah. And so you got to always keep tinkering. And you're like, it might be funnier if I say queef instead of fart. Right. So even the, the landing of the word oh, yeah. denotes a totally different outcome. In Completely. The and the yeah. way you say it, you say it fast, you say it slow, you say it loud, you say it soft. All that is uh, is. Is makes a difference. Yeah. Do you think there's like kind of like an underlying recipe that everyone kind of adheres yes. to, or do you think everyone just totally finds their finds their own different style? I think the good ones find their own way, and they know the fundamentals, and they can they can do it in their own way. Yeah. Uh, but that's what we call hack. When someone goes up and he goes like. Black people and white people are different, huh? Let me tell you why. Men and women or whatever, uh, you know, whatever the airplane peanuts is the classic hack line. But, like, <laughs> it's been done. We've already been, we've already realized it. But you get a guy like Mitch Hedberg. I don't know if you know about him. No. Oh, you don't know Hedberg? No, man. I'll oh. check him out. Check him out. He's, yeah. uh, he's a game changer. But he was a heroin addict who would do one-liners. And one of his lines was, uh, I like rice because uh, it's, oh, shit, I'm going to fuck the, hold on, hold on. I like rice because it's great when you're hungry for 2,000 of something. <laughs> so, like, 2,000 great, you're like, that's a fucked up, crazy thought, but it's funny, but it's so outside the box than the traditional kind of joke. Yeah. But it's still funny. Yeah. He had another joke where he goes, I used to do drugs. I still do, but I used to too. You know, you're like, whoa, no one heard this kind of format before for yeah. writing a joke. And so uh, when you can really make it your own, you still know the, the the tools and the fundamentals, but you can make it your own and change it almost a little. That's yeah, like like Pulp Fiction. He put the whole fucking movie out of order, yeah. but it works. Yeah, You know, it's he knows how to make a movie, but he made it in, in an original way. Gotcha. So do you think that people kind of have to figure out the fundamentals before they can go back and like really yeah, do their own thing? I think so. I, yeah. Unless you're some weird savant gifted person who can just spit out. Yeah. But that's that's pretty rare. Did you have anyone kind of take you under the wing and like show you how to, the ropes of like comedy and how to get things done? Or do you just totally have to figure it out yourself? You, you got it. Comedy is such a selfish thing, uh, occupation that like everybody's just out for themselves. And it's so hard that you... You're scrounging to get your own success, so it's hard to really lend a hand. It's yeah. almost like you're, you're you're sinking, and then someone else is sinking, and you're like, well, we're both <laughs> sinking here, so I can't help you, and you can't help me. Yeah. But you can get some success and then go, I'm going to... I'm a millionaire now. I'm a household name. I'm going to throw this guy a bone, that guy a bone. So yeah. uh, you do what you can with the... Uh, <laughs> With, with with the success you get, you can kind of go, hey, you want to open for me? Yeah. Hey, let me help you with that joke or whatever. So uh, the little things, but those go a long way when you're a young comic. Yeah. Did you have like ever like a moment where someone like that was killing it in the comedy scene like sat down with you and was like, hey, man, like here's a nugget. Like here's something. Oh, should, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And that yeah. meant the world to me. Like Bill yeah. Burr was always uh, one time I. Oh, I love Bill Burr, man. Oh, yeah. he's the king. Yeah. One time I opened for him, and he was uh, super nice and was like, wow, that joke's great. You could you could say this, this, and this. And I was like, oh, wow, yeah, that's great. And just the fact that he took the time to listen yeah. and then go, that's great, and I bet there's more there. you got to blow that out a little bit. And I did blow it out a little bit on his advice. But uh, stuff like that. Seinfeld gave me a shout-out on a... Oh, wow. I was bombing in Buffalo, New York at a comedy club. There was like eight people there. Eating shit, covered in sweat. I get off stage. I walk into the green room. I'm like, "Woo, boy, that was tough." <laughs> and my phone's blowing up. And they're like, "Some some guy goes, Seinfeld's talking about you on a on a news show or a, a broadcast thing." And I looked it up, and he was like, "Yeah, it's a comedian. I like uh, Mark Norman." And I was like, I, I immediately sent to my mom. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but it just shows, like, I was eating my ass at this club, <laughs> and then this guy, like, this guy I grew up watching, look up to, is talking about me, so those little things will keep you going for five years. Yeah, yeah. What did he say that he liked about your comedy? Well, somebody goes, uh, who are the up-and-coming guys you're, we should keep an eye out for? And he was like, there's this guy I like, Mark Norman, because he's, 
He's a, he's like a psycho about comedy like I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was like, hey, I've been called a psycho so many times, <laughs> but never in a good way. Yeah, never from Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah, cool yeah, one. that yeah. too. Because I got that shit all the time. Do you really need to do five sets? Well, what are you? All right, easy, buddy. Come on. What are you, some kind of weirdo? And I'm like, well, I'm just trying to get good. I, I'm not trying to attack you. Yeah. But I got that a lot starting out. No, I saw him in an interview recently, and, and um, someone was talking to him about how he sees comedy, and he was explaining it like he was obsessed. He's mm -hmm. like, my whole life was bits. Yeah. And, like, hunting them down, writing them down. He's like, my whole existence was like, how do I write the best joke? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I get that, because kind of, you can't beat it. Yeah. You can get better at it, but you can never really master it, and I yeah. think that keeps everybody into it. Do you think there's a thing in comedy where like people kind of hit the market with relevance, and then they kind of oh, yeah. struggle to kind of stay at the top of the pack? Definitely. There's a lot yeah. of right place, right time comics, or yeah. good looking comics, uh, and a lot of them tend to go to movies, because comedy is a very blue collar, hard working job. If you're like... Like a Bill Burr is a good example, or a Jim Gaffigan. These people, Brian Regan, Seinfeld, who just keep going into their 70s and 80s, Don Rickles. It's such a hard thing to keep doing because you build an hour. That's what it's all about, the hour. And then you put that out on Netflix, and then you have to build another hour out of thin air. Yeah. So you're making something out of it. It's like one thing to make a house. That's not easy either, but you have the wood, you got the blueprint, you got the plaster and the bricks. This is, there's nothing here, and I gotta think of one thing, then I gotta think of another thing, then I gotta think of it and connect it. And each joke takes weeks to figure out, but yeah. you need a hundred of them to make an hour or whatever it is, and uh, it's daunting. So it's a rare breed that sticks with that. Yeah, the interesting thing for me about comedy is it kind of forces people to stay really humble. Oh, yeah. Right? Because oh, yeah. if you are doing stadiums and you're selling out tickets, great, but they still go to like a small club. Yeah, like 20 yeah. people, not for the money, just purely to test material. Yes. And I think there's this constant flywheel of like, master the set back to the beginning. Right. Right, whereas a lot of other careers, they're like, I don't want to do that because I'm like better now, and that's like beneath me. But the comedy seems to be like constantly resetting yes. and rebuilding. It's the ball up the hill, Sisyphus yeah. or Syphilis, <laughs> whatever his name was. But yeah, it's yeah. that, and comedy is... All failure. Yeah. It's mostly failure. Yeah. So, uh, it, it's. With a sexy wood. It's comedy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's mostly failure. That's why 99.9 .9 people eventually fluff off. Yeah. Because they're like, I can't keep doing this. Yeah. You know, a movie, you're like, hey, I'll. Movie actor, everybody loves actors, but I'm like, they're just reading lines that someone else wrote. Not, not saying acting isn't amazing, but. It's not, you know, like like Daniel Day Lewis and Meryl Streep and all these people. There, there's some great actors. Yeah. But they're not doing the most of the legwork, you know. Like yeah. the comic has to go out and eat shit in Cleveland. Yeah. And then get back on a plane, go home, rewrite it, go eat shit in Philadelphia, and then come back. So it's it's uh it's oh it's they call them the warriors of show business. Yeah. And we're the lowest rung, you know. Like Jeremy Piven is on the. TV show, he's in movies, and then he, the movies dry up, so he's like, I'll do stand-up. And you're like, you're gonna go do the hardest thing now? Yeah. But it's, it's, there's no barrier to entry with stand-up. Meaning like, you don't have to learn to play the, the ukulele to be a stand-up. <laughs> you can just get up there and talk. Yeah. So, that kind of fucks us, because people don't think of it as this incredibly difficult craft. But... Right, so like, celebrities have like this sheen of like, you know, success and like they're an actor and all the rest of it. It's like there's yeah. accolades and like aspirational components to it. But like comedy, it's so easy to get into. It's just not as appreciated or like uh, yeah, admired. yeah, yeah. And I think good comedy, you're like whoa, Chris. We like we all love Chris Rock. We adore yeah. him. He's up on a pedestal. But he had to, he had to learn that or earn that. Yeah. But uh, you still when you see Leonardo DiCaprio and Le and Chris Rock walk into a room. You, you go, I want to talk to Leo. Look at, look at this guy. Yeah. He's handsome. He's, he's famous. He's a cool guy. Chris Rock, like, oh, cool. Chris Rock's here. Yeah. He's not handsome. You know, he's, uh, he's just a goofball. Yeah. But he's, his job is way harder than Leo. Got you. Yeah. No offense to Leo. No. But. Shout out to Leo. Yeah. He's <laughs> Today's episode has been brought to you by Rival, my agency. 
Now, if you're listening to this and you're a business owner and you're struggling on how to get your brand to go to the next level, then we're offering you a free discovery call with myself and my team. All you have to do is go to rival.com, R-I-V-Y-L.com. You need a name for your company. You wanna do package design. You need to do photography. Whatever it is, we got you end to end. So just go to rival.com, R-I-V-Y-L.com. Smash the link for a free call. Um, Do you think that like there's something particular in the New York culture that is calling for comedy? Like if somewhere Mm. like New Orleans doesn't have a scene, like why does New York have a scene? Is it because it's been here for so long? Is it because of the culture and how people operate here? Like it's a good question. Yeah. Well, I think comedy is an American art form. It started here, but uh, I think New York is. We're, it's full of arts. It's got yeah. like Broadway and jazz clubs and music and all this stuff. You know, the Lincoln Center, ballet, symphony. And comedy here is kind of taken more seriously. There's 11 comedy clubs in the city. Plus, you have crazy tourism. Millions of people flock to New York all over the country, all over the world. It feels like a giant Disneyland. Yes, yes. Because when we were walking around the main streets, we are like, how many of these people are locals? They look like they're from all over the place. Yeah. yeah. People need something to do. Yeah. So, hey, we'll go see a Broadway show. Ah, it's 500 bucks a ticket. Let's go see a comedy show. It's 50 bucks. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, oh, maybe uh, Kevin Hart will pop in. Maybe uh, Jerry Seinfeld will pop in. So that's alluring, too. And... Nine million people live here. Yeah. So I think all those factors together make it the the best city for comedy. Yeah. And then back to the fundamentals, like what do you think they are for comedy? Like what are like the kind of like the, you know, maybe not in every case, but like the main things that you have to kind of be aware of as a comic on stage. Oh boy, that's tough. That's that's a that's a that's a whole another that's a pod in itself, (laughs) that question. But I think I think you gotta surprise an audience. I mean, there's so many la- layers to this. First off, you have to, let's say the crowd doesn't know who you are. Like, yeah. I, I got a couple of fans now who will come out and see me, and they get me, they know me, so yeah. I can just be myself. But with a new comic, where the crowd doesn't know you, you have to earn their trust. You have to be interesting enough immediately and captivating enough immediately that they do give a shit. Because I used to walk on stage, and they would go, what were we doing later? Like, they would just see me and they're like, there's nothing interesting about this guy. Yeah. I might have had a couple funny jokes, but I didn't grab them yeah. immediately. And uh, so that's part of it. So you're going to have like a thing. I guess. Yeah. That's why, like, I'm the fat comic. I'm the black guy. I'm yeah. the gay guy. Like, that's why a lot of people have the guy thing. Yeah, they yeah. go towards that because it's it's a quick way to grab you. And uh, so then first there's that. Then you got to say something funny out of the gate. We also say something funny that's not divisive. Because, you know, it's almost like an appetizer. Here's the appetizer first. I'm not going to give you a steak <laughs> right away. i got to give you the app first and, and the water and then the bread and then the, then, the, then the lunch and then the dinner, whatever it is. So you got to kind of take it slow. You can't just go up to a woman and fist her. You know, you got to go, oh, hey, can I buy you a drink? Hello. And you want to fist her, but you got to do all the other shit first just to not yeah, look like a psycho. Plate. Yeah, you gotta have some foreplay. Yeah, and it's very similar to sex. Where like eventually I'm jizzing on your face, <laughs> but in the beginning I gotta, I gotta go hello, my dear, and let me buy you a cocktail and all that. You know, you gotta play the game, and and stand up's very similar. Yeah, but when you have your fans, you can just jizz right on them immediately, and they yeah. love it. Yeah, yeah, but you have to build that crowd. You have to build a tribe around yourself. Yeah, um, and that's when I guess you start to get like your own shows and your own tours, and that's. Is that like when a comic's like made it, when you can like travel and sell out? Is that like yeah, the I, dream? Well, yeah. I, making it is different. For me, making it is not, is having enough money from comedy to pay for your life. Like yeah. you don't have to be rich, you don't have to be famous, you don't have to sell out an arena. Just doing comedy as a occupation alone, to me, is making it. Yeah. Uh, just as a guy who fucking worked on a construction site, it's good to... Be able to just pay you're telling jokes and making a living that's yeah. an insane notion uh but you still want to go further you want to make more money you want to make more fans you want to you want to be able to sell out everywhere i think selling out everywhere is really the real making it of like oh we're doing the columbus funny bone and we added two shows right so there's such a demand that they add shows that's really a great feeling yeah and you recently came to australia yeah yeah we did three at the the elmore yeah, El- Sydney. Is it Elmore? Yeah. Yeah. The, the Enmore. Enmore. There yeah. you go. Yeah. It's kind of like a cool old school. Great room. Theater. Great room. It's really like tight. 
Totally. Yeah. Had a blast. I didn't want to leave Sydney. I love Sydney. Yeah. Australia is really a, that's a magical place. Yeah. Especially for an American, because we're kind of doing this thing in America where we're like imploding on ourselves <laughs> right now. Like everybody's mad at everybody and there's so much political division like and politi racial. Politics, is war on the, yeah. You know, like, yeah it's Men war, versus man. women, trans, this and all that. And like, I feel like Australia, you guys are like, what are y'all fighting about? <laughs> what? We're going surfing. Give me a beer. And uh, this woman is the hottest lady I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so um, you guys had a little, your COVID shit got a little, little wild. Yeah, we turned into a prison for two yeah, years. Yeah. Uh, that was shocking over here. I was like, you guys are the fun one. What are you guys doing? Yeah, it was kind of like, what are we doing here? Like, yeah. like, we need to like, yeah, loosen up a little bit. But yeah. Yeah, that was one point where, because um, I was living in Victoria, which is like near Melbourne. And for like 260 days out of that two years, we basically couldn't leave the house. Pretty crazy. That's insane. But now everything's open again. It's okay. great, man. We're fine. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I always say Australia feels like uh, America in the 80s. It's just like <laughs> fun. The dudes are still like kind of tough. The women are hot. You go surfing. The sun is shining. You're just kind of living life out yeah. there, and you're just you're having fun. It, there is a bit of a ceiling in Australia. I feel yeah. like, like um, comedically, like you gotta, you gotta kind of get, a, get yeah. out. You know, if once you really once you like funny, like okay, now like let's go to America. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Or, or with a lot of things, like I want to act. Let me let me be Mel Gibson, and I got to go to Hollywood. Or uh, what's that other guy's name? Eric Bana. Chris Hemsworth. Hemsworth, perfect yeah. example. Yeah. Uh, Charlize Theron, whatever. Yeah. No, and she's the, South African. Sorry. Dude, the Hemsworths are like, like. Idols in Australia. Yeah, I remember I was uh, I was living in um, a place called uh, Maroochydore, and there's like this bluff lo overlooking the ocean, and where there's like waves coming in, and people are surfing. And one day, the Hemsworth brothers were sitting on the cliff face, looking at the waves, drinking a beer. Yeah, and then like 300 meters back, like a thousand women in like a uh. semicircle, just like. Oh my god! That's hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> and they perfect. just kept turning around and waving, and then going back to watching the surf. No one wanted to go near them. It was wow! Like royalty. They're just like, just let them, let them you know, be in yeah. the wild. Yeah, let them be in the wild. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't disturb the, the leopards. But there's a ceiling, man. Like we got some great comics. Like we had, um, we had a guy, dude. If you look this up online, it's pretty savage. A guy named Rodney Rude was like mm. big in the '80s. Okay. Real foul, like black comedy. Uh -huh. Um. And then we have like Carl Barron, I don't know if you know him, mm -mm. or uh, uh, Arj Baka. Oh, sure. Yeah, he kind of made it in the US, I guess. Uh, and then we had like the, uh, wow, what's the name of that? Flight of the Concords. They're kind of like, oh, a, yeah. They're yeah. like, they're New Zealand, but like, we kind of yeah. like, yeah. New Zealand and Australia are kind of like, yeah. they, they were huge here for, you know, a couple of years. Yeah. Huge. They're on a TV show on HBO. Yeah, but how'd you tour in Australia go? Uh, I always wanted to, I did the Melbourne Comedy Festival in like 2015, yeah. and I had a great time, but that festival, it kind of keeps you in a little box. I didn't really get to do the whole city, Yeah. and uh, this one I was like, give me, I want Perth, I want Adelaide, I want Brisbane, I want Melbourne, I want Sydney, and I want New Zealand. Yeah. So I did the whole fucking gamut, and yeah, uh, I had a blast. Yeah, how'd you find the, the audience work like, compared to the U.S.? Did you have to write different jokes for like the Australian market versus? No, no. I mean I, I did my Australia chunk about quackas and uh, Aboriginals and all that, and it's fun coming in as the outsider because yeah. you guys do that fucking uh, that little speech in the beginning. Hello, we're on a, a stolen land, and we have to acknowledge that this is uh, we're not yeah. giving it back, but uh, we're acknowledging it. And I always <laughs> thought that was hilarious and a funny way to start a comedy show. So yeah. I would come out. And I'm like, look, I don't live here. This ain't my problem. I'm going to shit all over that speech. <laughs> and the audience was like, ah, thank you. We can't do it, so you do it. Yeah, and we can't say fun. anything. It's kind of like, it's like one of those topics you just can't touch it. Of course, of yeah, course. Like, oh, a foreigner can do it. Right, right. They don't know any better. It's not that fault. Yeah, yeah. And I, I did it. I went to Berlin, and I just did all Nazi jokes, and that was fun. <laughs> so, that I mean, that's kind of what the essence of comedy. Like, let me come in here and... and break the ice a yeah. little bit and uh it was fun and the crowds i thought were hot as hell and uh i just changed a couple things like grocery store names are different you had, yeah you guys don't have venmo you have what's your what's pay venmo is our pay um online pay oh uh what do we use for that i forgot the name of it uh stripe maybe or paypal or yeah uh, it's like a paypal type thing but it was yeah, some other that's, word yeah but I can't remember what it was, but I changed it to that because yeah. I had a Venmo joke. So uh, just stuff like that was my only tweak. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, what's next for you, man? Like you did the Netflix special, you've had a YouTube one. It seems like you're blowing up on socials. I'm seeing you on everyone's Oh, pods. wow, wow, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just want to keep going. I, I got a new hour cooking. I want to eventually put that down on a Netflix special or something. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just want to keep growing. And to me, it's about maintaining. I never thought I'd be here. Yeah. So I just like, want to keep this. Fuck, how do I just not fuck this up? Yeah. yeah. And, and I look at it almost like a wife where you're like, I like this. I don't want to lose it. I, I'm not even, <laughs> I'm not trying to go to arenas. I, I'm, that doesn't entice me. Movies aren't really for me. Um, so I like, th I like exactly where I am. I'm making yeah. a good living. I'm doing theaters, sometimes adding shows at theaters. I have my friends. We hang out. I like New York. I like my life. I want to maintain. Yeah. I, I'm not shooting for the moon here. Yeah. And uh, you said you had a lady? I got a wife. Yeah. 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 I got married about a year ago. I, I'd say I give it another six months. No. Just kidding. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're, we're doing great. We're moving on up. We're trying to have a, a couple of rug rats. Hey. And uh, yeah, that's the next... That's the next thing in my life. Yeah, awesome, man. And do you think, like, um, like something I'm interested in is, like, the dynamic of being a comic, right? It seems like a lot of the work is at nighttime. Yeah. So is this, like, kind of like you're a chef? Like, you have to wake up at lunchtime and, like, work late into the night? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, now <laughs> things have changed so much because comedy is... Uh, comedy is, like, crazy popular right now. We're in a boom, for sure. I would say you guys are the new Hollywood. You think? Yeah, I would debate that. Because, like, if you look at Joe Rogan, if you look at Andrew Schultz, you look at, like, Bill Burr, like... People are way more excited to see these people and like, like think think about it this way: like if a celebrity came to town and had a keynote, like they wouldn't sell as many tickets as a comic. Yeah, yeah, and they're definitely you know, not as you know put put an actor on stage. They're not interesting. You know, who cares about uh, what Johnny Depp thinks shit. unless you talk about the trial? Yeah, you know? <laughs> talk about shitting on the bed. Can That's you imagine fun. if he came out and became a comic? <laughs> and that was like his first bit. Yeah, but <laughs> you can't be a comic and have that many scarves and that hat and, the, and a British accent for some reason. Yeah. So uh, we would, we, you got to make fun of that. Uh, comics yeah. make fun of those things. You can't be that. It's, no. It <laughs> doesn't work. But um, wait, what was the question? Oh, yeah, the new Hollywood. I don't know. I think we're a little too um, gorilla. Yeah. Meaning, like, we do our own shit at our own time. You go to Hollywood, you, you shoot something now, and it's like, all right, first you gotta get a COVID test, then uh, we got union rules, so you gotta eat lunch now, and then we'll do a couple hours here, and then she's gotta rap because she's not that old yet, or whatever. And you're like, fuck this. We'll just shoot this in 10 minutes on an iPhone in my apartment, and it'll be just as funny. Yeah. So, yeah, I think those days are numbered because it's yeah. just so much more convenient. Look at this. I mean, we're, we're in a fucking peyote tent about to blow each other and yeah. uh, talking to the gods. <laughs> so this is way better. Yeah, this is way more fun. And, like, in the comedy scene, do you think that networking and building relationships has a big role to play in your success? Or is it just purely, like, just be funny? Uh, well, I think you got to be funny, and I think comics will help you more in this in this business than the industry. Yeah. So I think you got to have good relationships. You got to be cool to all the comics and help each other, and uh, try to have like a camaraderie, prop each other up. Um, so I think that's that's the relationship you you want to keep those yeah. relationships. And yeah. Like like I run two podcasts, both with old friends, like two guys. I moved to New York, we made friends early, and now we run podcasts together. So now we're in a business together. Yeah. And uh, I think that's that's the key. Like like a, a Rogan has all his friends on every now and then. You know, he'll have the Protect Our Parks guys or or uh, Joey Diaz will come on or an yeah. old pal and yeah. And uh, that that's what it's all about. Yeah. How many guests have you had on the pod so far? It's countless, <laughs> countless. Yeah. Um, you guys shooting multiple times a week? Or? Yeah, that's yeah. oh, that's what I was getting to. Yeah, we do work at night, but now with, with comedy so popular, pods I take up your whole day. Yeah, so that's so you like potting during the day, doing comedy at night. And yeah, like, now you have to like live both sides of the day. Yeah, yeah. and it the pod sells tickets, <laughs> so you kind of have to do it if you because we we want to be stand ups, so you want people to show up to the show, so you got to do the pod to sell the tickets to the show. Yeah, yeah. What do you think is like the the necessity now for comedy to have a pod, right? Because like I feel like maybe comedians ten years ago would have an agent, and then that's how like people would go see comedy. Whereas now it's like they have a podcast, they have an agent, they make content, they have Instagram, mm. they have TikTok. Like it seems like there's a lot of yeah. pressure, yeah, to, to create a lot more media now. Yes, this yeah. is all new. Like before, comic. The, the beauty of being a comic was you woke up at noon, 
wrote a couple jokes, smoked some weed, got your lunch, uh, played video games. Uh, it's 8 o'clock, I'll go do a show. Yeah. And that was your day, and now it's like, you wake up, you do two podcasts, you gotta book guests for the next podcast, uh, then you gotta, you gotta post a clip, so you gotta edit the clip, caption the clip, post it all on TikTok, think of a funny tweet, what's a funny tweet? And you gotta read the news, too, because you gotta know, okay, I gotta, I gotta write a joke about P. Diddy, I gotta write a joke about Kanye, I gotta write a joke about um, Alec Baldwin shooting a lady, or whatever the fuck it is. <laughs> so you gotta have you gotta have jokes on that too, and then you gotta go out at night and then do the jokes and then rewrite the jokes because they're not working well enough. And so it's it's a lot of plate spinning. Yeah, but I still would take that over roofing. <laughs> <laughs> do you have like a team helping you other than the pod and what you're doing with your friends? Or? A little, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a guy over here and a guy over there, and I throw him a couple bucks. Can you edit this? Hey, yeah. can you caption that? Hey, can you, you know, shoot this? So I, I got, a, I got a few guys, but it's, it's not like a well-oiled machine or anything. No. Do you think if like things keep progressing and accelerating the way they are, you're gonna have to kind of like put a little crew together and like figure it out or? Probably, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which would be kind of cool to have your own business, but then if you start having all these responsibilities, you're yeah. like, well, what the hell did I get? I got in this to not have responsibilities and now, <laughs> you know, like you look at a guy like Joe Rogan, he's like, ah, oh, the industry, fuck these gatekeepers. Yeah. And then you go, hey, this guy wants to do your pod. He goes, no, no, not him. And you're like, well, now you're kind of a gatekeeper. Oh, yeah. So you just, you gotta, keep tabs on becoming the thing you hate. You don't want to, you got to watch out for that. Yeah, yeah. And do you find that like going on the other people's pods feeds your shows as effective as your own show? Or like, do you think having your own show is like the thing that you need to be doing? I think both. I think uh, I think that your own show really behooves you. You got to like, comics are like, I don't want to do a pod. I'm like, I don't want to do it either, but you got to do it because it, it does help. And then I think going on other people's pods helps bring people to your pod. Yeah. And now we're doing kind of a crossover thing. Yeah, you know, like I think L.A. in like 2014, 13, that was like a really heyday because it was like Santino would go on Theo and then Theo would go on Bobby Lee and then Bobby Lee would go on Segura and they really helped each other and they all blew up. Yeah, it's kind of like a little tornado. Yeah. Because I was watching all their pods. The same. Because they're all like collabing and then like. I think I saw one where like Chris D'Elia swapped with someone and he was making fun of them as though he was them on his pod. Yes, yes, yeah. and you got to know all of <laughs> they them. They were just fucking with each other and it's just really funny. It was like action figures, you know, yeah, you got this guy, you got that all guy. Of them. Yeah, I discovered like Theo and Chris D'Elia and like all these characters like all like within that little system. Totally, totally, yeah. and uh, they all blew up. Like and Brian Callen. And, yeah, yeah. And, they, like, and they all went to the comedy store. So the comedy store for like five years was this magical a hub of all this crazy talent and everyone knew them before comedy was like let's go to a show and have some laughs who's on the show this will be fun i have no idea yeah. now it's like oh we're going to the show to see theo yeah and uh that that kind of changed the game and i i think also too nobody wants to say this but nobody was giving theo vaughn as obviously a hilarious guy santino is super talented funny guy nobody was really giving them their own sitcom that yeah. used to be the old way yeah and those sitcoms are kind of dying so then these pods came out and everybody's like well this is funnier than how i met your mother yeah you know or fucking big bang theory so let's watch this oh we watch bobby lee fuck around this is funnier <laughs> than tv so it, it they made us go there because they wouldn't give us tv anymore yeah and i was saying some outrageous shit like where bobby yeah, lee was that talking too. about Sucking dicks. And yeah. I was like, what are, you, what are you talking about, man? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, he's talking about his trauma and he's making jokes about himself. And I'm like, man, this is unreal. Like, you'll unreal. Never, you'll never get this in a sitcom anywhere. Never get a sitcom. Yeah. And it's we love it. It's like Kill Tony. Yeah, you know, you're familiar I mean, with Kill I mean, Tony? I've been addicted to, to Kill Tony, man. Everybody loves Kill Tony, but it's basically American Idol or The Voice or one of these judge shows. And they're just ripping on these people, having a crack. Yeah. At a, min a, a minute is ridiculous. Yes, it's, it's <laughs> pretty brilliant because you don't want too much of these guys. Yeah. You know, so to, they're describe the to de describe the show to the listeners, like if you look up Kill Tony, it's like a panel and they'll have like two guests. And yeah. I saw the one that you were on, the episode that you were on. Mm -hmm. And then they have Kill Tony or what's his name? Tony Clifton. Hinchcliffe. Tony Hinchcliffe. And then the guy next to him, I, a red man. Red little, man. Yeah. And then there's a band and they get a bunch of strangers in Texas to like come yes. on stage and do a minute. Yes. And then they roast them. Yes. On their minute or praise them. Sure. Yeah. Sometimes they're great and a lot of people are broken from the show, but. <laughs> 
it, it's American Idol, which is a huge show in America, but you can call a guy a retard. Yeah. So it's like America, it's like you said, you can say horrible shit. So yeah. it's the best of both worlds. You get this great judge panel show, yeah. like a talent show, but we can trash you and say whatever we want and uh, get drunk and the band is behind you and there's a live audience. I mean, it's, it's, it's a brilliant format. Yeah, and he was underground for like a long time. Yes, yes, like totally. 10 or 11 years he's been doing this, but now he's like one of the biggest shows on YouTube. Easily. He's doing yeah. the gar he's doing Madison Square Garden, he's doing the forum, so it's and people uh some people knock the show. He's like they're so mean to these young guys, but like these people sign up, they know what they're getting into. People fly in from all over the yeah. world just to get that maybe get a minute pulled yeah. out of the bucket. So in that way, it's really, uh, uh, it's helped comedy, it's boosted comedy, and then he gets these insane, you know, like, Rogan will go on with Tucker Carlson, or <laughs> Ric Flair, or uh, a UFC fighter, and you're like, Post Malone is on the show for some reason, you yeah. know, and it, so you're, now you're getting celebrity guests who are in the middle of this fucking circus, it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty funny, and you're seeing people do well as well. Yeah! Like, there's a few guys that went up on stage, did a minute, smashed it. Now they're doing tours. Yep, getting paid. And the funny thing yeah. is, if Tony went to some network, NBC, hey, we got a show to pitch. What do you think? They would go, "Are you kidding? This is <laughs> degenerate, idiot, sloppy, offensive, inappropriate." And you go, "Oh, okay." And that back then, that's when you go, "I guess my show sucks." Yeah. But now you have the internet, and you can go, "Well, let's let's put it up yeah. anyway." And it worked. Yeah. So fuck the internet. <laughs> fuck the gatekeepers because they're clueless. Fuck NBC. All these people. Yeah. Do you think you have any aspirations to like have your own club one day, like the no, mothership, no, no. nothing like that? No, that no. sounds like a nightmare, and I think you got to be <laughs> insanely rich. Yeah. And uh, I think what he did is incredible. It's an amazing club, and he, nobody talks about this, but it's like his secret weapon. He can go there, do two hours of comedy every night on two different shows on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Then he can go on the road on Friday, Saturday. And blow people's minds because they're like, whoa, where's the, this material is so well written. He's and, created like his own dojo. Yes, yes. Yeah. And he doesn't have to fly everywhere just to get all that stage time. Yeah. He's got it right in his backyard. And uh, and he's such a famous guy that it's going to sell out all the time. Yeah. It's going to sell out every night for years. So it's a pretty genius business model as as getting forgetting to be a great stand-up. Yeah, have you done the mothership? Many times. Yeah. Great yeah. club, well, great layout, and a comic designed it, so he knew how to how to make it. So explain that to me, like what's what's like a good situation for a comic on the stage? Like what are you hoping that the room has? Yeah, well it's yeah. all about I think it's all about uh intimacy and no distractions. So at his club you gotta bag up the phones, which is also great. But people go, What are you gonna say horrible shit up there? And you're like well, I'm going to say horrible shit that's funny, yeah. hopefully. We're not just going up there going, N-words. You know? yeah. we're, we're still trying to get laughs here. Well, so it's like, I, like what happened to Tony Hinchcliffe. Like, right. You know, he had a big issue with that. Yeah. It's just removing that. Exactly. So, And then that was all out of context, too. Yeah. But uh, so you lock up the phone so there's no distractions. There's no food there. Yeah, so people aren't, like, scrolling, texting, yes. and all that shit. Because it's hard. It's right here. We're addicted to it. Yeah. And you want to take a photo of, of a celebrity there or whatever. Yeah. So, um, so just like no phone. No phone. Everyone's and, fully focused. Exactly. And you can't yeah. get anybody in trouble. Let me record one word they said out of context and put it on the internet. So that's gone. No food. A lot of these clubs have chicken wings. How are you going to make someone laugh if they're like, ooh, chicken wing, mouthful, watching. No one's laughing. You got yeah. a mouthful of food and you got to order the chicken wing. You got to, when it shows up, the show's over. They, they don't do chicken wings at Broadway. Yeah. Hamilton, no one's eating a, a chicken finger. Yeah. So food's out. You want low, black, tight ceilings, uh, tight walls, and you want people to cram together. You just want it to be like um, almost like, a, like a, a pod of people, like a cocoon. We're all together as a unit. Yeah. And we can all laugh and then not laugh and laugh and then not laugh. And uh, it's so almost like a conversation. It becomes like a hive mind. So. Yes, yes. Right, so instead of the room being spread out, people are in like little groups of yeah. like five and they can chat with their friends and yep. check their phones and stuff. Is that what most clubs are like? They're kind of... The good ones, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're trying to get the crowd bunched up and fully attentive to what's happening. Yeah, and yeah. there's so many clubs where like the ceiling is a mile high and yeah. the laughs dissipate and you lose them. 
uh, or there's a post in the middle of the audience, like a big uh, column, and people are doing this shit. So that's already <laughs> over. Because uh, you gotta think, a laugh is so flimsy. It's it's very fickle. The the the, the joke to laugh moment. You know, like if one uh, glass hits the ground, that's over. Really? Yeah, because it's it's like a it's tension build, quiet tension, and then you break it with a punchline. Oh. So it's all ve it's hanging on by a thread. Comedy so it's like already. It's timing and it's like sensitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One one chair goes, yeah. and then people go, "What was that?" And then you missed the joke. So, so you're just trying to figure out an in. Yes. And it's almost like you've got the audience, you've got the premise, you've got like the things that you're stacking. And are you looking for a moment where it like pierces the audience and it's like that's the that's the moment that hits and then I can build on that? A little bit, a little yeah. bit, because it, I don't I don't want to piss the audience off, but I do want to prove them wrong. Because <laughs> they're kind of going, I don't know about this, and I'm going, No no no, I've worked this out. Yeah. And uh, like one of the lines was all uh, young people used to eat weed brownies and be like, Oh man, that's a lot of weed. Now young people eat weed brownies and they're like, that's a lot of sugar because they're so healthy now, you know, yeah. <clears throat> and yeah. young people don't drink as much anymore no. and they don't have sex as much. So there was, there was a lot going on in there. And uh, yeah, you just got to keep, it's almost like you're a lawyer. You got to keep going, no, no, I'm right because of this, because of this, because of this. And you want to like make those funny. building a case and you're stacking it. And yeah. It and, and it does have to have some big crescendo at the end, which I can't remember what it is now, but yeah, it's got to have a big old twist at the end to tie it all up yeah is that usually something that's like unexpected yes. random like yes is it, does it have to have some ingredients to the crescendo at the end yeah, yeah. and with a joke like that where they're kind of going against each other i think the end should bring them together okay and that's a good way to end it maybe yeah i can't remember how the you fuck. divide the audience and bring them back yeah yeah, yeah exactly because if you're going that's basically what a joke is you're going this way long enough you got to turn it yeah because now you're doing a joke the whole premise this is now we're getting heavy, heavy nerd <laughs> shit. But eat, there's a little jokes in there, but eventually the whole thing is a joke. Okay. Because a joke is like, bring it here, bring it here, and then twist it. I'm doing jokes, 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 and then I'm twisting the entire premise at the end. Yeah. Which the whole, now the whole thing is a joke. So you thought the premise was this, but now it's this. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And then you can converge it into other bits. Yes. And I guess with the whole structure of comedy, do you feel like with social media that it's morphing stand-up in a different way? Like, do you find Definitely. that when you, when you go on stage, you mentioned before you do Q&A now, mm -hmm. the end of your set. What does that mean? Like, take me through well, that. Well, the, the, the business of stand-up has changed, but good stand-up kind of still remains. Uh, like, now you can, a guy who's two years in or a girl who's a year in can just have one funny joke, put it on TikTok, it'll go viral, and she's kind of famous. Or yeah. she's kind of established and now can go sell tickets. Yeah. It's really all about selling tickets. Um, and so that was new. That's new. So it's bittersweet because you can blow up and be famous instantly without doing all the grinding and open mics and road work and failure that came with the comic in 2005. Yeah. Because there was no TikTok or Instagram. So you can like find an in now and get like international audience. Like, yes. You're big in Australia, even though you've only toured once. But a lot of people are probably going to buy if you go back, right? Hopefully, yeah. But that's because of your clips. That's because of your pod. Now you're kind of like not only limited to Australia, but you can go to Europe. You can yeah. go to Asia Pacific. So you think like social has broadened the it, horizons of where you can go. It's broadened it, but I'm saying that these young comic, younger comics can blow up immediately without doing all the hard part. Oh. And then I think that's, it's great to blow up and it's exciting, but it's, it's short money. Because then you go, uh, you go to these cities or this club, and you're not that good because yeah. you never had to struggle and and like you're Instagram funny, but you're not real life funny. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you could get there, but yeah. it's gonna. It, most good comics have been doing it at least 10, 15 years. So, yeah. as much as that struggle sucks, it's like Ozempic. Why would you work out when you can just take the shot? Yeah, you know. But the shot is gonna actually hurt your discipline and it hurts your 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 fortitude and and like your your will because you should want to go I'm going to work out I'm going to eat right come on I got to get my shit together you can just take the shot you, it makes things too easy which is great but I think you'll pay for it later so you think that like I think it's better to go through the struggle as much as it sucks there's some magic in the struggle yes and it does fucking suck and it it's long that's the hardest part for we're impatient 
You go, I don't want to do 10 years? What, what are you kidding? Like, imagine if I told you I had to go to, you, you want a podcast? Yeah. You got to you gotta work for 10 years, then we'll give you a podcast. Yeah. And you're like, ah, I'll just start a podcast. And you're like, yeah. all right. But you'd be better at podcasting if we did the 10-year thing. Yeah. But nobody's going to do that. But in comedy, in stand-up, I think you're better off doing the 10-year run. Do you think, like, um, from your experience, when you've seen someone who's, like, done well on social, go on stage, and one of the you know, the guys or gals that's been doing this for decades. Like, mm. what is the difference? Oh, man, it's it's night and day. You, yeah. There's chops. We call it chops. He's got chops. Like, What does chops mean? Chops means he's got experience. He he can, uh, he gets heckled, he can handle it. Uh, okay. uh, glass breaks, he's got a line for that. The lights go out, he can handle it. Um, he forgets a joke. He, he, he's got something in his back pocket. He, he's just prepared. He's got every tool in the belt. He's a fucking samurai. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, imagine you, th like, UFC fighters. They have to know how to grapple, how to do jujitsu, stand up boxing. They have to yeah. know all these, like, Muay Thai. Like, but, how to handle all of the variables. Yes. Yeah. But if you throw just a wrestler in a UFC cage, he's going to get kicked in the face <laughs> and it'll be over. So, yeah. you got to have the, the, the whole tool belt, I think, as a stand up. How did you start dealing with hecklers? Did you have them early on? Oh, I still get them. Yeah, still get them. Yeah, yeah. they're 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 pretty brutal because, as I said, it's you're hanging on a string with stand up already. Even when yeah. it's going well, it's flimsy as shit. Yeah, so it's a house of cards. So when a, one heckle comes, you got to be ready. The whole card drops, and then you have to you have to zing him. Then you have to zing him not by not being so mean. You can't just go, you fucking cunt, I hope you die. And the crowd's like, Jesus Christ, that's not like funny. Bill Burr in Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he still made it funny. He's like, you got a statue of uh, Rocky, Walt Frazier's from here, you won't even put him up, you fucking racist. I saw a comic once in New York and he kept fucking with this guy and the guy wouldn't laugh. And, uh, <laughs> and the guy was just stone-faced and the comic goes, well, what's your problem, man? Why, why aren't you laughing at anything? He goes, oh, I was just waiting for material. <laughs> and the comic was f fucking floored. He was he like he turned into two inches tall, and <laughs> he wasn't even trying to be mean. He was like, "Oh, I just like jokes. I like material. I like the art of stand up." <laughs> and you're just going, "What? What's that shirt all about? Is that your fucking friend, you douche? You know?" And he's like, "I just want to hear some material." And uh, I, I agree with that guy. Yeah, he just cooked him. Yeah, and I was in the audience like, "Whoo." I will be doing material. I don't want to be one of these crowd work guys because yeah. and look, I'm not. There's some brilliant crowd work. It's it's an art in itself. It's incredibly hard to do. If you can do it well, it's awesome to watch and, yeah. and very entertaining. But uh, I like ideas. I like a comic where they go up and you go, "Oh, I never thought of it like that." Oh, that's a great point. Oh, that's so funny. Oh, that's a great take. Yeah, yeah. So you you explain that you would do Q and A at the end of your set. So like, I guess. Is this separate to the performance, or is this an add-on? Like it's an add-on. I do yeah. like a full 45, 50 minutes in a theater, and then and this I, is for your show. Yeah, this is my my headlining show. Oh, you do Q and A right after your show. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So for 45 minutes. I, I kind of go through the new. I make some Trump jokes, some Biden jokes, some Elon Musk jokes, some Taylor Swift jokes, just shit. P Diddy, Mike Tyson, whatever is going on in the world, and then I'll go. Did I miss anything? And usually somebody will yell out. Uh, Jake Paul, you know, and I'll, I'll riff on Jake Paul. Yeah. And then somebody else will go, Gaza, and I'll riff on Gaza. Uh, hopefully, uh, any Gazans here? Woo! Oh, okay, hopefully only one of us bombs. You know, you say <laughs> something like stupid like that, and yeah. uh, and then that's, I kind of go into a and a naturally. I don't want to go, you guys have any questions? Right, so this isn't like an, like an official thing, but you kind of like do your material, yeah. and you like, fucking jam out for a bit. I jam out yeah. and that's where you get the clips. Yeah. So when OJ died, somebody yelled OJ. So I riffed on OJ and it got some laughs. And then the cameraman in, in the green room, I was like, clip that OJ thing. And then I put that on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. And then here we are. So now I'm not burning any of my act got online. You. You're creating this extra material. Extra material. So you can make his like uh, bits for Instagram. TikTok. Exactly. Yeah. Well, is there anything at the moment that you're obsessed with? outside of comedy that you're pouring your mind into? Uh, geez, that's a good question. I mean, I'm a big self-help queef. I, I love all that <laughs> shit. Like, what supplements to take? You need sunlight and all that. I, I think that stuff's really important, especially the more screen-obsessed we get. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really a fan of that. I love skateboarding. Really, man? I'm cool. a huge, I grew up skateboarding. I think it's a... A great uh, sport and all that. I love UFC. Yeah. I like any individual sport. Tennis, where it's just you against the other guy. Yeah. Um, 
or skateboard is just you against you. It's yeah. like mental shit. You against shit. The, the concrete pavement. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> basically. Yeah. So I love all that shit. I, I, I started a whiskey. I like to drink, uh, which is a fun way of saying alcoholic. And uh, <laughs> me and my buddy started a whiskey called Bodega Cat. It's, uh, it's a rye. It's available online. And uh, I do love podcasting, doing it, and I listen to probably five a day. Really? Who do you listen to? Oh, man. I love that Diary of a CEO. Yeah. He's great. Uh, Stephen Bartlett. There you go. Yeah, Good amazing looking guy. Man. Yeah, you you seem to be someone that's quite deep intellectually. Oh wow, yeah. really? Yeah, Jeez. man. Like I've been hanging out with like uh, Schultz and and Gagnon and like some of the some of these guys, and like I've noticed that, like comics are quite introspective. They're yeah. quite considered, and they like to think about big ideas. You just think it's like jokes, but it's actually like it requires a lot of like. Oh yeah, you know, time and cognitive power to figure out how to put a joke together. I think. Oh, we go yeah. deep, baby. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's to a detriment. Like, yeah. it's, you, sometimes you just want to check out. I think that's why a lot of us OD and drink because uh, it's a lot of deep thinking. And then, and then it's a lot of decoding because so much of the world now is telling you this, but it's actually that. Yeah. And so you got to figure out. Like, you go, oh, it actually is that. And then you tell people, like, no, no, it's this. And they're a, they think they're a hundred percent right. And you're like. I've done the research and thought about this for hours now. You just read a, a news article, yeah. you know, and uh, so that's a big part of, of comedy is is kind of being alone yeah. mentally and and uh, no one trusts you, no one believes you, but you're like, no, no, I'm, I'm told. It's like you feel like Magellan, like no, the Earth is round. They're like, no, it's flat. Shut up, and they put that fucker in jail. So you're obsessed with like working on your mind, developing yourself. You do like biohacking. You're like one of those guys that jumps in an ice bath and all that stuff. Nah, <laughs> I'm too uh, too lazy for that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I do. I work out every day. Yeah, I try to eat a good a, a certain amount of right foods and whole foods and all that. And I tried to meditate. Kept getting a boner. But um, <laughs> I, I I I definitely it's getting get sexy it. thoughts while you're trying to meditate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely all about the mental and the mind yeah. and the body's a temple. I totally get all that shit, but uh, I'm, Have not, you done a I'm float? not good. Have you ever gone like one of those like... Uh, I did that and yeah. it didn't work. Really? Yeah, well, I got yeah. salt in my eye immediately and it ruined the whole session. <laughs> yeah, they're brutal. Yeah. Did you did you get a kick out of it? The idea for my book came from a float. Whoa! Yeah. I'm one of those weird ones like I lay down in there and I see colors and shit like... Wow. Yeah, I felt like I was on mushrooms, man. Whoa, yeah. man. Yeah. See, I wanted that. Yeah. Maybe try it again. I'll try it again. I'll try yeah. it. It wasn't cheap. No. But no, it's not. I'll try it. Yeah. I did one where you do a, like an infrared sauna for an hour. Then you do massage for an hour, then you jump in the tank. Whoa, that might be the way to do it. Yeah, because what happens is like you completely sweat out any toxins mm. in the infrared sauna. It's like you're really putting your body under like pressure and it loosens you up for your massage. Mm -hmm. Then you get the massage and you're just jelly. Whoa, but the sad thing is I hear all that and I go, that's a lot of time without a phone. Yes. Isn't that what that... that that's pretty much what this all comes down to. Just, <laughs> you could just sit in a park without your phone and you probably have some cool thoughts. Yeah. But... We're too addicted. We're addicted, man. Yeah, we are. <laughs> it's a problem. It's it's really a problem. Yeah. And uh, I think maybe we'll look like Ronnie Chang. He's a comic. Uh, he has a great bit where he says, uh, we're going to look at social media like cigarettes. Like, you used Twitter while you were pregnant? You know? <laughs> That's a great bit. But uh, yeah. I think there's some truth to that. And this guy, Jonathan Haidt, is coming out with all these... Um, theories and studies and stats about how like depression is up on young girls and and suicide is up and all this shit. Yeah, because the comparisons, you know, they're like comparing yes, themselves to yes. like they're like I don't look like these like supermodels and it's like creating totally issues. Totally. And, yeah, it's too yeah. much coming at people. You know, it's it's Gaza, it's Ukraine, it's fist fights, it's animal attacks, it's it's uh, cancel shit and politics and Trump and buy. It's like yeah, it's a lot. We used to just Sit down and eat. You know? <laughs> now we're like, yeah. you know, it's we like, can't stop. What do we stop. do before phones, man? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so, isn't that weird? But you know what's cool? I watched a movie from like 1982 the other night. No one has a phone and you don't think about it. You're not like, where's everyone's yeah. phone? Because I think we know subconsciously that's normal. This is weird. Yeah. You know, like you never dream with your phone. You never in, your, in a dream going... <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's not what's supposed to be happening. It's really funny. I'm man. not one of these anti phone guys. I get it. Like with yeah. GPS, and you can communicate with a guy in Beijing. You can learn a language. You can read a tutorial on YouTube about how to change a tire and play the guitar. But 
You got to regulate. It's like alcohol. You shouldn't be drinking alcohol 22 hours a day either. No. But yeah. alcohol has its benefits. It takes the edge off. It's nice. It's, you know, it's uh, fun. Yeah. And the worst of it is like when you're like in the toilet. You know, yeah. Like just that, that whole like thing of like how people don't clean their phones and like bacteria and stuff. Totally. Like, totally. Yeah. And that and I think everyone's shitting now. 40% longer because of phones. You know, I used to read the Ajax bottle when I was shitting because I was so bored. And now I'm looking at a phone, so I'm like, I'll wait till this video's done, then I'll wipe my ass. Yeah. That's horrible. And then you're like, oh, another one. Yes. Oh, another one. I yeah. think uh, hemorrhoids in the phone, I think hemorrhoids went way up. Yeah. That's how you get hemorrhoids, is sitting on the toilet too long. Yeah. Fun fact. <laughs> so the phone has definitely kicked the hemorrhoids up. Yeah. Uh, and on a last note, um, to bring it to a close, like, what's the weirdest thing you've ever done to make a profit? Oh, wow. Jeez, that's a good question. I think I bet a guy once that I wouldn't uh, snort, um, or, or ch not snort, but like eat a glob of wasabi. Yeah. And I ate it. Yeah. And, and it sucked. <laughs> But he was like, I bet you 20 bucks you wouldn't do that. It was like, you know, You're like, 20 watch me years old. Bump. Yeah, and I ate the whole thing, and it, it, it was bad. Yeah. It was bad. I shit fire. You know, your throat <laughs> burns. You get that weird sinus pain. It yeah. feels like it would never go away. I think I got tased for a buck, you know, <laughs> party. Yeah, I'll give you a buck, but let me tase you. So shit like that, which is yeah. not, I'm not, uh, you know, doing anything progressive. Sounds like productive. you were pretty wild, dude, when you were young. We were just bored and feral and, and drunk. We just needed phones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That could yeah. have saved us. Yeah. We only had like the Nokia 33010s or whatever back then. Right. But yeah. hey, what about the times you got beat up by at school and you never got, no one filmed it? Yeah. How lucky are we? Like, yeah. I, even at your age, you know, I'm 40, people got in fist fights at a party and that was, you know, hey, Bob lost the fight, but it wasn't like, Hey, Bob, you're all over a uh, world star. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you just lost a fight and you dealt with it. It's embarrassing. Yeah, because yeah. I think I was, I was 13 where we had, like, those Nokias, like, coming to my school. The who? The Nokia, like, you know. The, oh, Nokia, yeah, yeah. Nokia, yeah, like, the, the, those, like, thick phones. I remember the brick. And I remember people making fun of kids because they had a phone. Oh, really? Like, oh, this loser has a phone. Whoa. Call, needs to call his mommy, you know. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. That makes more sense, actually. Yeah. But you couldn't do, like, social media. It was just, like, you had snake and snake, yeah, text. Yeah. All I remember, remember the T9 took you, like, a half hour to write one sentence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You'd have to write crazy. it with, like, the letter two and all the rest of it. That should be maybe a law. Yeah. T9's no, got to come back. <laughs> yeah, so just so it takes people longer to write a text, so I think it would, it would cut it down, yeah. like, 25%. Well, people are doing it now. People are buying dumb phones. There's oh, really? brands out there now, I don't know the name of it, but they're like for festivals. So when you go to a festival so that you're not stuck on your phone, you like clip it to your shirt and it like records the festival. So huh. you can like record everything, oh. but then it doesn't like have all the other bullshit. So it's just a camera. It's just a, it's a camera essentially, but you can still text and call. Uh, oh. But you can't like go and view what you're that's recording. That's good. Yeah, it's clever. So it's like you pin it to your shirt, you can record everything that's happening. Sorry, I just punched the mic cape. Um, yeah, you pin it to your shirt, you can record everything. Um, and you can text and call on it, but that's it. That's really smart. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I mean, it's what you need, man. Yeah, because we got all these dumb tricks because we're <laughs> such idiots where we're like, leave the phone outside the bedroom every night or, uh, you know, leave the phone over here or put it on grayscale. You know, all these yeah. little weird, dumb tricks. Now, turn off, you do it. I have an app that turns off Instagram after I've used it for too long. Yeah. And then it goes, you want me to turn it off? And I go, nah. <laughs> so like I don't even go with it, you know. But that, that's how bad. That's how like uh, undisciplined we are. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mark, thanks for joining us. Thank uh, you. We had a blast. Huge fan. Excited for your next set. When's your next special coming out, or your next tour? Well, I, I just put one out um, late last year, so it's gonna. I'm still building the new hour, so I'm, yeah. I'm trying to shoot it in like January. So we'll yeah. see. Yeah. But I gotta say, talking about good podcast, good interviewer, Thank great you, man. questions. You kept it flowing. Well done. Hey, I appreciate that, man. Hey. Thank you so much. Today's episode has been brought to you by Rival, my agency. Now, if you're listening to this and you're a business owner and you're struggling on how to get your brand to go to the next level, then we're offering you a free discovery call with myself and my team. All you have to do is go to rival.com, R-I-V-Y-L.com. You need a name for your company. You want to do package design. You need to do photography. Whatever it is, we've got you end to end. So just go to rival.com, R-I-V-Y-L.com. Smash the link for a free call.